Welcome along, friends, to our next installment. I'm Dr. Jim Daly. We're going to discuss the red supergiant star Antares. It's October 15th. And we open up tonight's episode, tonight's uh, video, looking south-southwest at the early twilight sky, the early evening sky. And you can note right down here is where we see Antares, red supergiant star Antares. Now what we'll do is we'll zoom in on that star. Actually, we're just going to take a look at its um, attributes here. It's a highly evolved red supergiant star. It's enormous. It's huge. And if we flip over here, take a look at uh, comparison uh, to the sun and to the star, the red giant star, Arcturus, it's enormous. Antares would exceed or contain the orbit of Mars. If it was uh, replaced, if we replaced the sun with Antares, it's an enormous star. All right, because it's late uh, in the season, summer is gone. We're well into the fall now. Most of the summer stars, most of the summer constellations, are now setting or receding from view uh, to become visible next year in the opening part of spring and into next summer. Okay, so what we're going to do, what we can do here with Stellarium. We're going to back up the sky a little bit, just to give a better sense of what we're looking at and uh, the sky in the surrounding areas, and the sky around uh, Antares. Okay, so here we took away the atmosphere and we're looking due south, south, southwest, and we see the scorpion here. In fact, let's go back a little bit further. We see the sun. This is the sky as it would appear without the atmosphere. We'll turn on the constellations here. Excuse me, that's the... Okay. This is the great the teapot of Sagittarius. Looks like a giant teapot in the sky. Directly to the west, we have the giant scorpion. Right here. Put up the, uh, the imagery. You can see that it's the heart of the scorpion, Antares. This uh, new feature in Stellarium allows you to highlight the various asterisms. We've been talking about this uh, in our, you know, various points in the recent videos. An asterism is a recognizable pattern on the sky that's easily recognizable and allows us a uh, pattern recognition aspect of our imagination. We can zoom in on it and see it, although it might not represent the actual constellation as, as described by the Greco-Roman mythology. It's recognizable to us and we can easily navigate the sky. Okay, that's what we call an asterism. And its use is, if not just to identify it is of itself, it helps us to nav navigate to other parts of the sky or other objects of interest. Okay, so this is our asterism. This is the, the scorpion here. And here are the constellation lines right here. Okay, in the case of Scorpio, we see that the asterism closely resembles the constellation itself. Okay, and the bright star is Antares here. Antares might not be among the brightest stars in the sky in terms of their apparent brightness as seen by the eye, but the absolute or the intrinsic or fundamental brightness or luminosity of Antares is enormous. And the reason I'm including it in the list of the top 10 brightest is because of this fact. Antares is what we call is of the first magnitude. It's approximately equal to the first magnitude. It's one of the brighter stars in the sky, perhaps not one of the 10 brightest. And I include it in this list because it's because of its intrinsic or fundamental luminosity. 600 light years distant. So the light we see tonight from Antares left that star approximately 600 years ago, okay, about the 14th century, 14th, 15th century. So the light is 600 years old. It took it's 600, approximately 600 light years away. It's enormous, as we saw earlier. Okay, like to most stars, by and large, all we see are points of 
bright points of light in the sky, or for a bright star, or any star for that matter, is simply a point of light on the sky. Even with the most powerful telescopes, with, the, with a few notable exceptions, Antares is one of those exceptions. That star is so enormous, even at over 550 light years distant, we can resolve its disk optical. We can actually resolve the star with us and so, and take a look at it like so, and like this here. Click this to open up the, uh, the full image here. We can see the extended atmosphere of this star. Now keep in mind that this is star is not like a star like our sun. It's an evolved red supergiant star. Okay, it's long since exhausted its complement of hydrogen fuel in its core. And it's using helium, perhaps heavier elements such as carbon and oxygen to produce energy. And, as in, and in so, producing the next heavier element in the periodic table of the elements. This is the most detailed image ever of this object or any other star apart from the sun. It should be pointed out that this is the best image of the surface and atmosphere of any star other than the sun. So this is the star as it looks in real time right now or whenever this image was produced. Um, yeah, this is the, uh, the story back in August 23rd, 2017. Okay, it's a very large tele. This is an, Im an actual image of the star Antares as seen in real time. It's a physically resolved, the physical disk of the star is resolved in real time using the European, European Southern Observatory's very large telescope, um, VLTI, very large telescope interferometer. We've constructed the most detailed image ever of a star, and that's the red supergiant star Antares. Okay, it's a remarkable image, and you can see aspects on the star consistent with a highly evolved star that's nearing its, its the end of its life cycle. All right, and will soon uh, will soon end its life in spectacular fashion as a type two supernova. Okay, getting back to Stellarium. Okay, so we can see and if we turn the atmosphere back on, we're going to see that the uh, that we have to go ahead in time to actually see the star, or the, the sky as it is now, looking due south. Okay, yeah, that's, this is at 7.15 um, today, October 15th. Let me turn off the constellation imagery. Okay, this is the skies will appear tonight, October 15th, looking due south south-southwest. You can see in Sagittarius, everything is going to be setting soon, and these summer constellations will be gone from you until next spring. It's notable, though, also that I'd like to point out here, Jupiter and Saturn are still well-placed high in the south uh, for observation with a nice pair of telescope, with a nice pair of binoculars, rather, or a telescope. Uh, if you were to scan this region with, your, uh, with binoculars, would be very pleasantly surprised to be able to see um, Jupiter and Saturn in the same field of view. You can zoom in on Jupiter here. See the moons, the four Galilean moons, famously discovered by Galileo over 400 years ago in 1610. Io, Callisto, Ganymede, and Europa, named in his honor as the Galilean moons. What's nice about Stellarium is you can see the placement of these satellites in real time. <clears throat> so if you're observing with a telescope, and you have your little laptop next to you with your telescope, you bring up Stellarium, you can actually look for the moons, uh, and you'll be able to see them in real time uh, as you would up on the sky in your telescope. It's a very nice aspect to Stellarium. Okay, moving on over here, let's look at Saturn quickly. Okay, then the beautiful rings of Saturn. See a nice face on like this. This is the, a view you might see in an 8 or 10 inch or 25 centimeter telescope, amateur telescope. If, those of you who have never seen Saturn for the first time, it's, uh, it's a review you're not going to soon forget. You can see Saturn's moons, likewise, uh, as we did with Jupiter, um, along with the beautiful rings, um, all in real time. Okay, zooming back out. Back to our setting here. Okay. Previously, in our 
series, not a series of the ten brightest stars, we talked about the star Vega right up here. What we'll do probably in the next video is talk about Deneb and Altair. These two stars are um, among the top ten list of brightest stars. Deneb, like Al like Antares tonight, is an evolved blue-white supergiant star. Deneb is enormous, probably even bigger perhaps than Antares. Good thing about Deneb being that it's actually much further away also than Antares. When it does explode as a supernova, we're going to see the spectacular light show in the sky, but we won't suffer any of the ill effects from a supernova. Had it been closer, any supernova within like 50 to 100 light years would be pretty um, detrimental to life on Earth. Okay, and out here down here is a star uh, similar to Vega but at 40 light years, and it's the principal star in Aquila the Eagle. Okay, getting back. All right, now that we've discussed, uh, described uh, Antares in um, seeing these aspects of the star, this, this uh, variation in brightness on its surface suggests uh, turbulence right below the star's photosphere, or the outer layer of the star's atmosphere. Uh, which indicates also that uh, uh, the see the stars have, are remarkable self-regulating dynamos. As the star's internal composition changes, as its as the nuclear fuels change, the star adapts and always always wants to maintain what balance between inward gravity and outward pressure, which is what holds the star together. Hydrostatic equilibrium is the is the term. Right. Hydrostatic equilibrium is the is what keeps the star, like our sun, stars like our sun, and all stars, even stars such as this, like Antares, uh, are in a constant state of uh, adaptation as the internal internal dynamics change, temperatures, pressures change. The star will will adapt. And we see evidence of this in these bright and dark uh, features on its surface here. Okay, what I'd like to do now is, um, I should mention also while we're here, let us go back briefly, because I want to mention something here that uh, is an important aspect to this view. The tower is here. We've mentioned in two separate occasions these objects called globular star clusters. And it's quite fitting to talk about this within the context of discussing Antares. Globular star clusters contain some of the oldest stars in the universe. Some of these stars date back to the, some of the first stars that formed maybe 10, 11 billion years ago. Some of these stars, stars like Arcturus, we talked about this at length. We mentioned the globular star cluster, Messier 3, the third entry in Charles Messier's catalog of non-cometary objects, or objects that you would avoid if you're looking for comets. Okay? The brightest stars in these clusters are stars such as Antares, stars such as Arcturus. And there's a notable example here also in the, star, in the constellation Scorpio. So let's take a look where that would be. Turn on the the search tool in Stellarium, we'll look for Messier 4. Messier 3 was in Booties, the herdsman, which is the principal star was Arcturus. In this case, we're going to look for M4, which is the next in the catalog, the fourth entry in Charles Messier's catalog of non-cometary objects. And there it is, very close, immediately to the west-southwest of Antares. And let's zoom in. There's M3, the globular star cluster. Okay, zoom out just slightly. You can see here this is Antares immersed in a cloud of uh, re what they call a reflection nebula. There's a leftover gas and dust. Since we're looking in towards the galactic center, we're looking in towards a part of our galaxy where the concentrations of gas and dust are higher. This dust, if it uh, surrounds the star, will reflect the star's light in this case, since uh, the principal output of Antares is in the red part of the spectrum, the visible spectrum, the reflection nebulosity will, gl will glow 
with a yellow-orange hue. All right, and some of this nebulosity also may be ejecta from the star. Stars in an evolved state, such as Antares, uh, exhibit this property also of ejecting large quantities of material as they evolve towards their end of life, their end of life, ultimately to end in a spectacular supernova, type two supernova explosion. Okay, so I'm going to zoom back out. So you can see where this is. A pair of binoculars. The problem with observing at Messier 4, although it's an object bright enough right there, it's also at 7,200 light years, Messier 4 is approximately 12 times its distance to Antares, and thus its light has to pass through the intervening gas and dust we see here in this view. It's actually relatively close. It's about 7,200 light years distant, whereas M3 is approximately 25,000 or three times further away. And this just, this distance as being relatively close is consistent with what I just said. Okay, it's rather dim. So if we scan this, you have to look hard, but you can see it. I've seen it in a pair of uh, 10 by 50 binoculars, 10 by 60 binoculars. It was visible. You have to know exactly where to look, and you need good observing conditions. A clear view of the night sky, uh, if it's clear and dark, um, if you're looking from a metropolitan area or urban area, it's going to be difficult to see, perhaps because of the light pollution. So in order to see an object such as this, where you're, it's already uh, you're at a handicap because of the environment in which it's located, um, you want to be able to maximize your ability to see it. Okay, so I'm going to zoom back out. Turn the atmosphere back on. Fast forward to the current time. Now 7.15. It's about 30 minutes from now. Okay. You still see the galactic center placed here. Uh, in this south-southwest south, south, south sky, but that part of uh, the sky will soon be giving way to the stars of fall and, uh, and winter. The great philosopher Plato famously said, Astronomy compels the soul to look upward and leads us from this world to another. Astronomy for Change is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to affect positive change through astronomy and science education. It is our belief that by inspiring and empowering current and future generations to become interested and engaged in astronomy and science, this positive change will be realized. If you found this video helpful and educational, please like, subscribe, and share. Also, why not consider supporting us on Patreon? Head over to our homepage, astronomyforchange.org, click support us via PayPal or Patreon, and head, over, head on over to our Patreon page and choose a membership level suitable for you. Every little bit helps, support, helps us produce the great content and further our mission. Also, why not consider becoming a member? Membership is free at Astronomy for Change. Head on over to our home page. Choose the membership. Membership link here. Click it. Put your name and your first name or, and your email, and you'll be added to our list. You'll receive a comprehensive digest of all our videos and articles and all our great content. Joining and becoming a Patreon, a patron, helps us grow and improve and more fully realize our mission. Thank you. This is Dr. Jim Daly for Astronomy for Change. Until the next video, please stay well and keep looking up.